Stay 
Just like he will mine, if I just remember, he lives deep inside, so I should I worry, why should I fear, when this very same Jesus is always so near, he lives in my heart, and he hears when Storm passes 
Thank you, ladies, so very much. Take your Bibles and go with me, if you would, back to the book of Galatians. This will be our last message uh, in our series. I think this is 15 or 16 uh, that we've preached, but I want to finish out the book this morning, and I'm so very thankful uh, that you're here today, and I don't say that lightly. I looked up, you know, just a few, just a few Sundays ago, uh, we didn't have a choir, we had an ensemble, and we had, that's a, that's a fancy word for a few people singing and, uh, and we had so many people traveling and sick and gone. And, and so I'm grateful that you're here today, grateful that you're able to be back with us in the Lord's house and be visit with us today. Once again, I want to say welcome. Thank you for being with us in the service today. And I hope that you'll mind the Lord and all that's said and done. I want to preach on this topic. And uh, I, almost, I almost finished with the last, uh, the last message. I almost finished uh, with that and, and didn't finish the chapter out. But... Uh, as I begin to read, I, I don't see how you could skip this portion of it. And so once you find your place in Galatians 6, would you stand with me? We're going to read from verse 11 down through the remainder of the chapter. And uh, I, don't, I don't intend to preach long this morning, uh, but I do want to share with you what I believe that we can find in these verses. Paul said in verse number 11, You see how a large letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature." And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Let's bow one more time for a word of prayer. Brother Chuck, if you would, how about taking us to prayer? Amen. Thank you so much for standing. You can be seated. <clears throat> I start with this, with this portion. I, I noticed that, uh, you know, oftentimes when, when the Apostle Paul would write a letter, uh, he would sort of he would sort of give the letter out, or as he would speak the letter, and he had sort of like a transcriber. He would pin this down, and and uh, he would send the letter out. But Paul said here, uh, you see how large of a letter I have written to you with my own hand, and I think that's significant as we look at the at the portion of scripture because uh, it tells us that Paul took the time and Paul uh, pinned that down. Many people believe that that he had that large letter because of. Uh, his eyesight, and we, we learned that before, and we talk about the thorn in the flesh, and other people believe that, but whatever the case might be, Paul's specific in telling us that he penned this letter down by his own hand. And the reason I think that is so significant is it shows Paul's earnest care for this church. Now, you say, well, preacher, did he not care about all the other ones? Absolutely that he did. But when you see what he was battling, you see what he was facing, I think that I think you can find that Paul is going to go back and make one final plea to set things in order in the church of Gal in the churches of Galatia. He's going to make one final push, if you will, to drive his point home uh, as we've been talking about this thing of justification by faith, which is the theme of the whole book of Galatians. And so he says, I I've written this letter by my own hand. Uh, I begin to think about this. Have you ever saw a, a sign, and, and you know, we use, we use bold letters, right? If you, if you want to get your point across, uh, we, use, we use bold letters or something to, to stress the importance or stress the value of, of the message. Uh, now, old people text, and sometimes we hit that caps button, and it's all caps, and it, we're not mad, we're not upset, we're just too ignorant to use technology. But you get the message, right? All caps or all bold or something, it, it, it stresses... And I thought about how, how much plainer could it be than to be pinned down in block letters. 
And here Paul said, I've written this letter. I want it to be very plain and I want to be very clear in the message in which I'm given. Now when you find, when we look at it, we've already read it obviously, but when you see the topic of, of the latter portions of these verses, I don't know that there's a more significant topic in all of Scripture than how Paul concludes this letter. I don't know that there's any, any message that's any more vital and any message that's any more important. As a matter of fact, all of Scripture from Genesis all the way down through the end of the book of Revelation, everything tells the story of what we would call redemption. The whole Bible is a picture of redemption from the Old Testament pointing to the sacrifice, that lamb that would be slain, uh, to the New Testament as he walked upon this earth, to the time when he went to the old rugged cross and he died. The whole scripture points to God's redemptive plan for fallen man. And Paul closes out this letter reiterating if you would, these things. Now we understand what was happening with the Judaizers. For those that haven't been in our study, uh, the Judaizers had crept into these churches and what they said was this, we're embracing Christianity. We're for Christianity. You know, we've, uh, we believe that God's, God's working and God, uh, God sent His Son Jesus. We're embracing Christianity. However, we also want to incorporate these things of these certain tenets, particularly this thing of circumcision, uh, into this process of salvation. Now, I know that's a, that's a quick way of reviewing what they were facing in these churches of Galatia, but, but essentially what it was is they were, they were speaking of the necessity of keeping part of the law, and it's a plea, uh, listen, for a works-based salvation. Anything that you add to Christ becomes work-based salvation. Anything. Uh, whether, it's, whether it's church attendance, whether it's baptism, whether it's church membership, whether it's any of those, if you're adding any of those tenets to the grace of Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed on Calvary uh, and his resurrection on that third day, if you had anything else that says, hey, this is necessary for salvation, you are clinging to a works-based salvation. And as these Judaizers came into these churches all throughout the region of Galatia, what they were spreading was, is, hey, you need Christ, you need Christianity, and that's okay, but you also, you've got to try to marry Judaism with Christianity, and you've got to do this portion of the law, and then you also need Christ. And it's mingling, or it's trying to mingle, a works-based salvation. Let me tell you this, works-based salvation never works. Never works. It'll never accomplish what God intended to accomplish through the, the, the blood of His Son. Now, you say, why is that? Man's been trying to, trying to works based salvation ever since the fall, ever since Cain. Ever since Cain brought his offering of that which he grew in the ground and that's which he tilled with his, own, with his own hands and that he worked with the sweat of his brow, that which he produced and he tried to offer that to God for God's satisfaction and for God's approval. Ever since that moment, all the way down through time, man has been trying to self-justify himself. But yet, my friend, God doesn't justify through workspace. God justifies through his son Jesus. If you're here this morning and you've never received justification which only comes by grace through faith, let me tell you this, you'll never be right in the sight of God clinging to a works-based salvation. And Paul concludes this letter that's going to be read among all of these, all of these local assemblies, all of these body of believers, these different bodies of believers in, in the church uh, in the region of Galatia. He concludes with the significance of battling this works-based salvation of the Judaizers. Now I want, to, I want to look at, at three things this morning and we're going to jump right in. I want to look at three things that I think we can learn from this text. I want to preach on this thought, by the way, if you had not figured it out. The impact, and Paul uses a phrase, of the cross of Christ. The impact of the cross of Christ. Now before we get to the cross, I want to, I want to deal with something else. Paul, first of all, exposes the vanity of works-based salvation. The vanity of works-based salvation. Now, if you look down to verse number 12, he says this. He exposes these Judaizers once and again. Now, we, we know that he's already called them out, right? They trouble you. Uh, I would that they were cut off. The, they, they, they've hindered you that you should not obey the truth. He said they're a real problem in and amongst you. They, they're a real problem. But now Paul is going to point, uh, literally, Paul is pointing to their insufficiencies as they're promoting their doctrine. 
You say, well, well, preacher, what is the vanity of works-based salvation? And it's not just that of the Judaizers. It still holds true today. Anything that you're trying to do to accomplish justification on your own merit, in addition to or apart from Jesus Christ, is empty, it's vain, and, and listen, it'll never accomplish what you're designed for it to accomplish. In verse 12, he says this, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that ye may glory in your flesh. Now do you see that word glory that's found in the latter part of verse number 13? That word glory is a word that simply means to boast. Now that's kind of arrogant if you really look at it. For me to, to boast that I could earn my salvation or that I could that I could achieve justification for God on my own or that, or that Christ, quite literally, that, that Jesus and his blood is not enough but he kind of needs my help to attain this, uh, that's pretty arrogant of anyone who would, who would have that mentality. That's pretty arrogant. That's pretty arrogant of any religious leader or religious organization that would, that would promote that kind of doctrine and that kind of teaching that Jesus would, would need our assistance. And that we can put ourselves up on a pedestal and say, hey, look at what I've accomplished. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've enabled myself. And so he deals with the vanity of this works-based salvation mentality. All right, now there's a couple things about as he, as he exposes them. You know, some things, some things um, look good on the outside. They sound real good. You know, a lot of religion sounds real good. A lot of religion looks real good. It, it, you know, it cleans up a man on the outside, but it does nothing for him on the inside. Now, I'll go on record. I, I'm not against religion. I'm not against organized religion. Uh, that's why we're here this morning. I'm for corporate worship. I'm for assembling with the body of Christ. I, I'm not against religion, but I'm against anything that just cleans a man up on the outside and leaves him corrupt on the inside. And a works-based salvation will do just that. It makes you outwardly appear that everything's good, but inwardly you're still as corrupt as you were prior to that. All right, so first of all, works-based religion focuses on that, the outward appearance, rather than the in inward change. Look at the first part of verse number 12. He said they desire to make a fair show of the flesh. We've known people that way. They, they desire to make a fair show. They appear to be something when, when they're really nothing. Uh, the Pharisees were like that. The Pharisees were like that. They appear that, that they're really, they really walk with God and they really know God. They appear to be so devout and so religious, but yet Jesus called them a bunch of whited sepulchers. He called them a bunch of vipers. You say, why is that? Because they were, they were appear, they had an appearance on the outside. He said, here's what's happening. These Judaizers have crept in with a message that sounds good, with a message that, that sounds like, well, maybe this is a good thing. After all, after all, the keeping of the law, there's nothing bad in and of itself of keeping the law. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt you know, not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not bear false witness. There's nothing wrong with those things. As a matter of fact, I would highly advise you not to kill somebody. I think that's a pretty good principle to live by. However, those things are not sufficient, nor do they equate into my salvation. Okay? And so, so what he's saying is, is, is it sounds good on the outside. Isn't that, doesn't that seem to be the way false doctrine always operates? It's just enough of the truth to sway you into that thinking and to sway you into that stand. Paul exposes them for who they are. And so he said, listen, they're, they're concerned about the outward appearance. All right, uh, Not only does he expose the outward appearance of works-based religion, but, but, but their, their religion was striving for this thing that we would call even today, we can, we can recognize this for social acceptance. You say, what do you mean? They didn't want any trouble with the Jews. They didn't want any, any heartache. They didn't want to be labeled. They didn't want any persecution. We're going to find the end of the chapter. Paul said, I've had some persecution. I've had some persecution for the, cross, for the cross of Christ, but what they wanted is they wanted to be able to marry both, and that way there's kind of no ruffling of the feathers. We're seeing that that's crept into the church today. Today. Political correctness and all this stuff that's crept in, and now we've put our stamp of approval in the name of love and in the name of tolerance. That's, what, that's what's happening in our society. 
In the name of love, now, it's, a, it's the wrong definition of love. It's the wrong definition of tolerance. But in that, they have guilted the church into feeling, well, if we stand solely upon the cross of Christ, which, by the way, the cross of Christ requ requires a preaching, a real, re preaching a, a real preaching of the sinfulness of man and of the redemptive work of Calvary. Real, real preaching of the cross of Calvary requires us to preach that a man stands before God unjust, a man stands before God undone, a man stands before God unrighteous, and thus we need the salvation that Jesus provides. But the message of today is what? It's love. God loves everybody. Well, we know he loves everybody. That's why he went to the cross, for God so loved the world that he gave, right, his only begotten son. It's a message of tolerance. Well, you know, preacher, Jesus ate with sinners. Yes, but Jesus never justified their sin. I'm thankful that Jesus ate with sinners. I'm thankful that Jesus looked out and he saw those with sheep without shepherds. I, I'm, I'm a sheep without a shepherd. I'm thankful that Jesus saw them in their need and saw them in their condition. That's why he went to the cross. And I'm thankful for that. But I'm going to tell you, our world, what, what are we doing? We're striving to marry. Man, we just don't want to ruffle feathers, preacher. That's just the society we live in. We just want, don't want to do it. We don't want to, we don't want to be labeled as, as hate speech. Well, listen, truth is truth. Now, I don't have to hate. I don't have to be arrogant. I don't have to be hateful. But I can stand for the truth. What is the truth, the most significant thing? It's not a works-based religion. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He reveals their hypocrisy. Verse number 13, the first part says this. For neither they themselves who are circumcised, they don't keep the law, but they want you to keep it. They don't believe in this tolerance. They don't believe in this except, but they want you to believe it. The hypocrisy. The hypocrisy of works-based salvation. The hypocrisy of the doctrine in which they were spreading. Let's move on quickly. Notice their source of pride or their boasting. Man, we don't have anything to boast in apart from Calvary. We'll see, Paul says that in just a minute. But this wasn't a works-based religion. This wasn't their, their reason for boasting. You know why they boasted? They boasted because they made a certain amount of converts. Their pride was the fact that they drew some to their side. They drew some. It, it had nothing to do with there was individuals who did not know Christ and they were headed to a place called hell uh, or facing the judgment of God because they'd never been justified and they preached the gospel and now these people come to know Christ as their Savior. That's not what their boasting was in. Their boasting was in, man, we turned them to our side. I'm not, I'm not, I'm really, I promise you I'm not getting political this morning. But it was almost like, you know, it was almost like, well, this person was, was a Republican and, man, we now we pulled him over here to the Democrat side. It was, a, it was a victory for their party rather than it was for the cause of Christ. And that was their boasting. Look, we swayed them. We pulled them. We're, 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 we're infiltrating them. We, we've numbered them with us. It had nothing to do with Jesus. Isn't that kind of significant? That's how works-based salvation works. It's all about me and pump, what a good person I am and what a good individual that I've become and how much I've accomplished. And so Paul exposes them for who they are. By the way, uh, works-based preaching, works-based salvation still ought to be exposed from the pages of Scripture. You say, why is that? Men can never go to heaven clinging to a works-based salvation. Listen, if you're here this morning and your, your philosophy is, well, I'm going to keep trying to do good. I'm going to keep trying to make myself better and, and I'm going to try to, to let my good... No, no, you're, you're clinging to a works-based salvation and you're missing the significance of the cross of Christ. He exposes that. All right, look at the second thing with me this morning. He explains the value of the cross of Christ. He explains the value of the cross of Christ. Time won't, me, won't, won't really allow me to permit... won't really permit me to preach this as I, as I believe that it, it really ought to be preached. But he talks about the value of the cross of Christ. Do you understand something this morning? There is nothing as precious as, as the story of Calvary. Now you understand the story of Calvary don't end with the cross. The story of Calvary begins way back before the mud seals of this earth was laid and God in his providence knew man was going to fall. And Jesus said, I'll go to pay their price. 
The story of Calvary goes all the way through the Old Testament prophecies when it talks about the coming of Messiah who will take away the sin of the world. Isaiah 53, all the way down through. The story of Calvary has to do with that virgin birth that we'll celebrate at Christmas. The story of Calvary will have to do with those 33 and some years, some odd years that, that Jesus walked upon this earth, leaving the example. The story of Calvary obviously culminates on Golgotha's hill, but the story of Calvary also goes on and continues to the resurrected Savior as he got up victorious. And the story of Calvary will see its culmination whenever God's people are redeemed from this old body and we're taken forth up there. I'm thankful for the complete story of the cross of Calvary. And so when you find out, listen, the value of the cross of Christ, when referencing the cross of Christ, we're, we're not speaking of a Christian good luck charm. We're not speaking of that. Listen, all over churches, we got one on the front of the building. We got one on the inside of the building. Uh, you might have one on your Bible cover. You might have a piece of jewelry with the cross, and, I, and I'm not against any of that. But let me tell you, the cross of Christ is much more significant than that. Have you ever noticed today that, that the cross is always depicted as something that's, that's kind, of, it's kind of pretty, it's kind of, it's kind of neat and, and tight? Do you realize that's not the cross of Calvary? The cross of Calvary was a bloody cross. It was a cruel cross. It was a vicious cross. It was an instrument of torture. Yet it was of infinite value. That instrument that the Romans designed to torture someone with the most excruciating pain and the most excruciating death turned out to be one of the most valuable, one of the most beautiful things that's ever been on the face of this earth. And it wasn't because of the wood in which he was crucified on. It's because of the one who was crucified. Amen. The value, the value this morning of Calvary. Paul is referencing not on the event but also the ramifications of the event. You see, Calvary is not just, uh, when it talks about the cross of Calvary, he's not just referencing the historic account of the crucifixion. But it, it encompasses all of the ramifications that came from Calvary. Do you realize today that that event, all those thousands of years ago, a couple thousand years ago, all those events still have ramifications that's impacting societies today? And if Jesus tarries his coming, those of you with small children, you know what it'll do? It'll impact their society if we'll tell them about it. Those, those that came and they gave in this offering and they was, you know, we laughed and we smiled and all that. Do you know what gives them hope for eternity? It's the cross of Calvary. You know what gives them hope that they'll be able to succeed in this life as far as in, in a crooked and a broken world? It's the fact that they can know Christ as their Savior and they can have justification in the sight of God. Why? Because of the value of the cross of Calvary. My good works, your good works, or their good works can't purchase that. And so he's, he's referencing the ramifications of Calvary. If you're here this morning and don't know Christ as your Savior, listen, the ramifications of Calvary can be seen in your life today if you'll put faith in Jesus and allow him to justify you. Matthew Henry describes the cross of Christ dealing with that title. This is a, this is a great description. If you take notes or you write this down, I don't know that you're going to find a better description than what he calls it. It is the doctrine of salvation by a crucified Redeemer. I want to say that again. When, when Paul says the cross of Christ, it is the doctrine of salvation. What, what, was, what was he battling? He was battling the doctrine of, of, of a works-based salvation. He, he was battling the doctrine of these Judaizers that were saying, you need works, you need law, you need circumcision, you need all of these things. And he said, oh, no, no, the cross of Christ speaks of a doctrine of salvation by a crucified Redeemer. You realize that, that that phrase, crucified Redeemer, man, that's what got the Jews so tore up. That's, that's what made him so furious. That's what infuriated. That's why Paul had many stripes that was, that was laid upon him. That's why he was arrested and thrown in prison and thrown in jail. It wasn't because Paul was a bad citizen. It's because he preached about the crucified Redeemer. And not only the crucified Redeemer, but the resurrected Redeemer. Mankind today needs a redeemer. There's no doubt about it. Mankind needs a redeemer and Jesus is that redeemer. And so it is the doctrine, the cross of Christ references the doctrine of salvation by a crucified redeemer. It's to this concept that Paul declares, God forbid that I should glory. Their boasting was in the fact that they pulled people to their side. 
Their boasting was in the fact that, listen, we, we drew them to our, to our part of the argument. They're, they're now teamed up with us. But Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of Christ. Save in the cross of Christ. We find Paul writing to the church at Philippi regarding him having no confidence in the flesh. You can go to Philippians 3 and read that. Paul said, I, I, had, I, I had everything in the world that they're talking about boasting about their, their works. They're boasting about the keeping of the law. Paul said, if you want to know the truth about it, he said, I kept the law. You want to know the truth about it? I was very devout. I was, I was zealous in those things. And yet Paul said, I count them all. He said, I just count them all as waste, as refuge. Why? He, he said, it's, it's not significant for me to boast in. The only thing Paul said that I'll boast in is in the cross of Christ. Now, let's look at a couple of things about the value. First of all, it's valuable because of the price of redemption. What did redemption cost? We know what it cost. If you've been in a church any length of time, you know what redemption cost. It cost the very life of our Savior. In normal circumstances, the, va the value of something is generally revealed by how much it costs, right? If something is not great value, it, it, it really doesn't cost a whole lot to replace it. Really doesn't cost a whole lot to go back. Listen, you know, uh, we, we talk about things that would be in value or things that would, that would really not have a whole lot of value. You probably got stuff, some of you ladies got stuff in your pocketbook that's really not of a whole lot of value. Um, some of you fellas have had, had things, you know, you've had, um, anybody have chapstick in your pocket? You keep chapstick? Okay. Do you ever just wig out when you lose a tube of chapstick? Or when you find it in the dryer? <laughs> Y'all have never done that, right? And you, you, man, well, I knew I had that somewhere, and I laid it right there with my keys, and then all of a sudden you go out and, and your wife's got it laid up on top of the washing machine because it was in the washer. You, you just break down and weep and cry because it was so priceless. You know what you do? You say, well, it's all broke off in the lid anyway, and you throw it away and you go get another one. Not very valuable, Right? All right, listen, but there are things in your life that you have that, man, they're, they're expensive. Those are the things that you tell your kids, be careful with that. Or don't touch that. Don't even look at it. <laughs> Just don't even look at it. Don't even go near it because if you go near it, you say, why is it so valuable? Because of the price that it costs. Can I tell you why the cross of Calvary is so valuable? It's not valuable because it... it it's a, it's a piece of wood. It's not valuable because of the location that it was at. It's not valuable. Oh, no, no. It's valuable because of the price that was paid on that place. Amen. When you look at redemption and what redemption, what, how much did it cost to redeem you? To provide redemption for you. What did it cost? Do you realize it cost God becoming incarnate in the flesh and going to Calvary and paying a debt that you couldn't pay? We say that, right? We sing about it. It's so familiar that it rolls off of our tongue. We know it in our brain. But if you ever really thought, how much did it cost for you to go to heaven? How much did it cost for God in heaven to look down as you and an individual and say that person is just a, that sinner, that fallen one, that one with the old Adamic nature, this person is now just in my sight, this person is forgiven, this person has been cleansed of their sin. How much did that cost? Let me tell you, it cost more than a good luck charm. It cost more than a few prayers and it costs more than just a few good works and, and, and a few good deeds. It costs the very life of God himself incarnate in the flesh. That's the value. You say, how much am I worth to God? How much am I worth to God? You're worth enough that he sent his son to die for you. But you're also worth enough, hey listen, that you need to understand that you can't do it by yourself. Man, and the value of that. Philippians 2, 8 said, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled, speaking of Jesus, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Colossians 1, 20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down on the right hand of the Father, or the throne of God. 
I wrote this down. Man, the audacity of, of man or any kind of doctrine that would have the boldness and the arrogance enough to try to take credit for the work that Jesus did on Calvary. I, I can't wrap my mind around that. The arrogance of saying Jesus paid such a high price and now I'm going to take some of the glory for it. Jesus paid such a high price that I can be redeemed, but I'm going to take the glory, put myself up on the pedestal, uh, move over, Lord, there's room for two. I'm not trying to be irreverent, but do you realize that when we put that significance on our good works, that's exactly what we're saying? Lord, just me and you up here. Oh, no. It's not valuable because of the work and effort that you put into it. It's valuable because of the price he paid for it. And so may we never forget when we deal with the cross of Christ, when we deal with, with the significance of that, it's because of the price that was paid for redemption. What about the product of redemption? I, I like this. The product of redemption. We have, we have believers today that absolutely are engulfed in this world. The opinion of this world, the affairs of this life, the, 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 the push or the, the drive behind. But you know what Paul said? Paul said, because of the cross of Christ, listen to what he said. He said, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. You know what Paul said? Paul said, this world's dead to me and I'm dead to this world. I don't live any longer therein. I don't live by their rules. I don't live by their guidelines. I don't live by their values. I am cru I am dead to this world. The world don't impact me. The world don't affect me. I don't fear this world. I'm not in bondage to this world. I'm dead to the world. Listen, if you're, if you're saved by the grace of God this morning, let me tell you something. You, you've been made dead to the world, to the judgment of this world, to the outcomes of this world, all because of the cross of Jesus Christ. I don't live under those things. I don't have to live under those things. Let's move on quickly. What about the, the perspective of regeneration? The perspective of regeneration. Now, in other words, look what he says in verse 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. Really, Paul said it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. It's, it now has become just a medical procedure. It really doesn't matter. We know that's what the significance of it then. He said, you're not any better off because you've been circumcised. You're not any worse off because you haven't been. He said, none of that matters. He says, the only thing matters, look at this, but a new creature. A new creature. Listen, it's not about being a member of this sect or of that sect. Now, I'm, I'm going to say something. I don't, I don't want to run you off. But you realize you're not going to heaven because you're a Baptist. Y'all realize that, right? There will be other people in heaven besides independent Baptists. Now, they're going to have to sit in the back row, but there's going to be more people in heaven. Now, I'm just kidding. But I'm going to tell you, a lot of times we have this mentality, we're the only ones going. It's not about being a member of this sect or this division or this organization. I believe you ought to get it right. I believe you ought to worship right. I believe your doctrine ought to be right. But I can, do, I can do everything right. But the significance is, is I've, have I ever become a new creation in Christ Jesus? Let me tell you something. Being a Baptist won't make you a new creation. It won't make you a new creature. Getting in that baptistry won't make you a new creature. It won't do it. It'll get you wet. But it won't make you a new creature. Only Jesus and the cross of Christ can make a man a new creation. Now let me tell you the difference. A new creation is not an outward appearance of change, but it's an inward regeneration that produces change. That's the difference. Religion can give you the outward appearance of change. I can turn over a new leaf. I can do better. I can be better. But religion will not change me on the outside. But salvation through the cross of Christ can regenerate me from the inside that will produce the change on the outside. He said the only thing matters is if you've been made a new creature. Whether you've been circumcised or not circumcised, none of that matters anymore. You say, what is that? It's perspective. It's perspective. 
Only the cross of Christ. You know, the doctrine of salvation by a crucified Redeemer. Only the cross of Christ can produce these kind of results. He gives us a promise to the regenerated in verse number to the regenerated in verse number six, 16. And as many as walk according to this rule, the rule found in verse number 15, peace be on them, mercy and upon the Israel of God. He goes through all that peace. Let me give you one more thing. Because Paul also expressed his vigor toward the cross of Christ. Now, I got, I got several things, but listen, can I tell you this? Paul was committed. Paul was convinced. But Paul was settled. Paul wasn't wrestling with, is this right? Is this not right? Paul wasn't wrestling, do I need to keep the law? Is it worth the suffering? Is it worth the trial? Is it worth being marked? Paul wasn't wrestling with it. Paul had it settled. I wonder this morning, do you have it settled? Do you have it settled? Are you settled in Christ Jesus? I'm not asking if you're religious. I'm not asking if you're doing better than you used to. Do you have it settled by the cross of Christ? Have you ever been made a new creation, a new creature? He said, from henceforth, let no man trouble me. Now, now we, we do know that they had troubled these churches at Galatia. Paul said, from here on out, don't, don't let anybody bother. Just don't, don't be the source of my, of my problems. He said, let no man trouble me. They don't, they don't bother me. I, I, I'm settled in, in, in my lifestyle. I'm settled in the way that I've chosen to live my life because of the cross of Christ. He said, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can go back to the Apostle Paul. You can study the beatings, the shipwrecks, the, all of the events that took place. I got to thinking about this. Do you realize that Paul's life drastically changed physically for the worse after the road to Damascus? Paul had it, Paul had it made when he was Saul. He was pretty high in rank. He was on his way. He was climbing the ladder. He would have been a man that had been very respected. He would have probably had a wealthy life. He would have probably had a life of very much ease. He would have been highly respected. He would have probably been a high teacher. Uh, but yet he chose. I, I got to thinking about this. You know, the Bible tells us that Moses chose to suffer the affliction of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. I believe Paul is an example of, an old, of a New Testament Moses. I believe he did the same thing. I believe Paul said, I, I'm willing to suffer for this cause. By the way, Paul knew what kind of suffering he was getting into because Paul was the one that was inflicting the suffering before he changed sides. Paul knew what he was getting into. Paul didn't enter into it blindly thinking this is going to be a life of ease. This is going to be a life of comfort. And when Paul penned this letter by his own hand, he said, listen, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. You know, Paul was probably a scarred man. He probably had scars. They say Paul was kind of sickly, regardless of the fact. Paul had some scars. But man, none of those things moved him. You say, how do you know that? Paul tells us that. Acts 20, 24, he said, but none of these things moved me. Neither can I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify, look at this, the gospel of the grace of God. Take your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians. I'm done. 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Listen to what Paul writes. He said, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. You know what Paul said? Paul said, it's settled. I got it settled. I got it settled. I'm not living. I'm dead to the world. I'm dead to the things that the empty world would boast in. I'm dead to that. Way, and the world is dead to me. I'm not living for those things. I'm living because I've been transformed into a new creature because of the doctrine of a crucified Redeemer. He said, and I'm settled. That, that's, that's not only good enough for my salvation, but it's the life in which I choose to live. So I'll ask you one more time. Are you settled?
Paul exposed, Paul ex exposed those who were clinging to this works-based salvation. Ask yourself the question this morning, what am I really counting on? What am I really holding on to? Hey, well, I know I'm going to heaven because of this factor. If it's anything less or in addition to Jesus Christ, it's vanity and it's empty and it won't secure eternity. Paul goes on to express the fact that, you know, he, he had, it, it was valuable, right? He expressed the value because of the price that was paid for your redemption. Your redemption didn't come cheap. Your redemption didn't come cheap. And who do we think we are that if I put myself on an equal playing field with Christ as if he needed my help or he needed my assistance? No, it's the cross of Christ and him alone. Do you have it settled this morning? Would you stand with me today? Miss Stephanie, if you'll make your way to the piano and just begin to play softly. Two things this morning. If you don't have it settled, if you don't have it settled this morning, I'd like to invite you. This is an invitation. I'd like to invite you to come and allow somebody the opportunity to take their Bible, show you how you, how you can have it settled. Jesus paid your sin debt. He paid for it. In full, paid for all of it. Man is justified by faith. And that not of yourselves. <clears throat> so if you need to come this morning, won't you slip out right there from where you're at? Number two, Christian, if you're here, maybe you've had a fresh look this morning of the significance of Calvary. You just like to make your way to an altar and say, Lord, just simply this morning, thank you. Thank you for providing what I never could. Thank you for paying what I couldn't afford. Thank you for the day that I settled it and helped me to live for you. 